The Point of View is brought to you by Cowbell Coffee. Cowbell Coffee. Taste it. Love it. Kel Choco Toothpaste. Kel Choco. Happy Smile. Bell Aqua Active. Bell Aqua Active. Stay true to originality. Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television. Here on The Point of View, we get the right guests, ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. It's an interactive show, and we have a big, big guest tonight. Based on all that's been happening, the explosion at um, Bogosu Apiete, Parliament reconvening on Tuesday, and other issues affecting the government. He'll be speaking to us on all these issues. We'll be right back. Nothing wakes me up better than a cup of cowbell coffee. Delicious coffee aroma. Mmm. How can you forget your lines again? I'm sorry, sir. Just that it tastes really good. Cowbell coffee. Enjoy the delicious creamy coffee taste of three in one cowbell taste coffee. It it's a beautiful day. Oh! This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Mami Josie. Ah, fe fe. Ah. Mm. <laughs> Different era, better result. Time has changed and time has brought Cal Charcoal Toothpaste. Healthy gums, anti cavity, fresher breath, and it whitens teeth. Kale chocolate toothpaste. Sankofa. Yenchi. Kale chocolate toothpaste. Happy smile. Welcome back. So tonight we're speaking to the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources who is also the member of parliament for the Damongo constituency, the person of Honorable Samuel Abujinapo. The Bogosu area has come under fire. At least there's a big story from there. On the 20th of January, there was a massive explosion of something that later was found to be dynamite and stuff that were being conveyed to a mining site. Affected some of the residents there. We'll also be talking about what actions his ministry has taken since that incident occurred. We'll look forward to parliament reopening tomorrow and what their plans are, and other issues, greening Ghana, the fight against Galamsey, all of that in the next hour. Good evening, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Bernard. And thank you for having me, and a very warm good evening to your cherished viewers. You've been almost a year in the job. How has it been? <laughs> Tough, exciting. <laughs> was this the ministry you wanted, or this was what was given to you? Classified information. Wow. <laughs> because you were Deputy Chief of Staff, which is a big role in itself. Yes. To move to a full ministry, how is that transition like? Well, I mean, these decisions are made by the President. He, he decides where you go to and who does what in his government. And as you said, I had the rare privilege of working directly with the President. Deputy Chief of Staff is like Deputy Chief Aide to the President. And um, I work under the Chief of Staff very closely and by extension directly with the president and the president felt that in his second term this is the work he wants me to do for him mm. so yeah the I transition see. yes uh, transition the, the for me the most remarkable difference between that 
the role I played in the first term and the role I'm playing now is the levels of responsibilities. As deputy chief of staff, you didn't have somehow ultimate responsibility if you want. I mean, you worked under the chief of staff, so she gives the directions and you report to her and the back stops with her if you want. But here, I had a department of the government, I had a ministry, so mm. it's a bit different. So mm. You've been in the news for quite, at least some good reasons, before Bogoso. I think the tree planting was quite popular. The Galamse fight is something that's been on and off. What would you say has been the most important thing you've done in your first year? Well, the, what, what I would say to be the most important thing is um, the sense of direction. Mm. Sense of direction in the management of the lands and natural resources of our country. I mean, the thing about the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, as it is for all such ministries across the world, especially um, when you talk about the extractive sectors of our of 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 the world, the extractive center. You you have all kinds of syndicates, cabals, uh, illegalities being perpetuated in those areas, and to say you will. Uh, uproot it or to say you will totally extinguish it is, can be a bit utopian, can be a bit impracticable. But what is important is that you put the framework in place, you put the building blocks in place, and you structure a lands and natural resources industry or sector w which is reasonably satisfactory. And so the most important of the things that we've done, in my view, is that in almost all the sectors under the lands and the of our country, there is a sense of direction. And so if there's Galamsey happening somewhere, we have a, a regime or a framework which can respond to it. If people are encroaching on the, on the public lands of our country, we have a system in place which will respond to it. If there are issues of uh, deforestation, we can respond to it. So the most important thing is that you have the machine in place. Mm. So let's come back to Thursday, 20th January. We hear there's an incident in Bogoso. At what point did you hear and realize that there, there was something to do with your ministry? Because usually if there's something like this, this interior ministry that will be thinking. Exactly. At what point did the Ministry of Lands become aware that this is actually something to do directly with you? So Thursday was a cabinet day. Mm. We were in a cabinet meeting. And then the news was... Uh, conveyed to all of us. Uh, when I say all of us, I mean the President, uh, the Minister for National Security, Minister for Interior, Minister for Information, and myself. And we were the frontline ministers who had to respond to this. And the President coordinated the efforts himself. And mm. so in between the meeting, he was taking uh, reports and coordinating the government response. Mm. And the first thing that the President um, instructed be done is for NADMO and the other security agencies and relief agencies of our, of our country to respond immediately. So the first response was extremely important to the president and that was deployed and deployed effectively, almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And thereafter, the president himself tweeted, as you recall, and that also became a subject matter of discussion and he got a tweet out mm -hmm. and then instructed that the vice president leads a government delegation to the community, which is what saw the vice president lead a delegation which comprised of myself, the information minister, the minister for interior, and the heads of security agencies in our country to the community. And thereafter, we got a, f a sense of what was at stake. As you recall, initially, there were reports of some hundred people dead and that and that. And so the president needed to be on top of the situation. And so whilst we're in cabinet, he kept shuttling between cabinet and mini briefings and reportings to be able to have a full grip of the situation. And, and that's how we got to know and that's how we responded. So in terms of your part of this issue, when you got to know it was a mining company that was expecting the goods, yes. for want of a better word, and the fact that mm -hmm. it was a licensed explosive company conveying it, what did that mean? I'm asking because your, your first statement your PR unit issued was Ministry investigates circumstances leading to fatal explosion at Apiate. Mm -hmm. And basically, let me just read two paragraphs. The Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources through the Inspectorate Division of the Minerals Commission is investigating circumstances leading to the accident involving the transportation of explosives at Apiate, a community near Bogosu in the Western Region on Thursday. This is in line with the Minerals and Mining Explosive Regulations 2012. Then you say the investigations will, among other things, help government to determine whether the regulations covering transportation of explosives were complied with and also what led to the unfortunate tragedy. Government is determined, as indicated by the president, 
to assist a return to a situation of normalcy. So at this point, is this the main investigation going on, or this was without prejudice to other things that may have been happening? Well, a direct answer would be that it was without prejudice to other invest ongoing investigations. But as you rightly pointed out, this particular incident mm. um, falls very much within the four corners of the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources because mm. what happened in Apieti really is about uh, health and safety of the mining industry of our country. That's mm -hmm. essentially what it is. Mm -hmm. So that all the value chain of the mining industry of our country, uh, beginning from the manufacture of explosives to the transportation, the storage, and the use of explosives for mining falls within the four corners of the mining regulatory framework of our country. And therefore, the health and safety of that activity, obviously, must be the preoccupation of the ministry and myself, which is why we issued that statement, which is why we've taken further steps, uh, first of all, to visit the place, second of all, to launch a full-scale investigations into the health and safety component of mining relating to this particular incident. So I, I always try to explain. When these, for example, what has happened, there are um, multiple investigative uh, mandates. Mm -hmm. So the police will have to investigate, I mean, road safety issues, uh, criminal issues and all of that. The Ghana Fire Service will have to investigate the fire component of it. The Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, through the Minerals Commission and its allied agencies, will have to investigate this, the health and safety protocols the adherence to the health and safety protocols of this particular incident. And so the specific regulation which comes to play forcefully is LI-2177, which is the LI which regulates uh, the use of explosives for mining, you know, and, and which is why I've had to take the steps to uh, give instructions for the chief inspector of mines to be, in, to be in interdicted, and which is why I've had to take steps to get the explosive company, the company that manufactures these explosives, to be interdicted. In fact, I just found out this morning when the preliminary report was presented to me by the Minerals Commission that the company which was responsible for the manufacture of these explosives also subcontracted the transportation of the explosives to another company. Wow. Okay. So uh, the Magzam, Magzam. company... Magzan Company is the manufacturer of the explosives. The company which was responsible for the transportation of the explosives was Josidec uh, Company Limited also. So I've since given another instruction, another uh, instruction to the Minerals Commission to suspend the registration of this company and preclude it from the transportation of explosives until mm. the investigations are concluded. So uh, this is a distinction that I have to draw very clearly. The, the health and safety of mining mm. and mine support services falls within the four corners of the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. And of course, at some stage, we need to conduct an inquiry into the broader issue of health and safety protocols of the mining industry generally, mm. not only in respect of explosives or the use, transportation and manufacture of explosives, but the conduct of mining operations generally as they relate to the health and safety protocols. We have to conduct that investigation. So, so if, if, if I have to be that's clear, where we come in. you have directed the Chief Executive of the Minerals Commission to interdict the Chief Inspector of Mines. That is correct. Effect. That is correct. Pending the outcome of the investigation. Then you've also suspended registration of Magzam. And uh, further suspended the registration of Jose Tech Company Limited, which is the company which was subcontracted by Magzam Company Limited to transport the explosives. And all of these are interim whilst the investigation goes on. That is so. Now, we were told that the uh, explosives were being conveyed to Chirano in Western North. That is so. And that Chirano Mines was the one that placed the order. That is so. Good. So if you've suspended the transporter and the manufacturer, what about the person who place the order because the, the, the explosives were being sent to Chirano yes. and they are the largest company within the chain. Why haven't any actions been taken on the Chirano mines? Well, at this stage, and, and I have to um, say this very strongly, you have to take decisions on a reasoned basis and on a basis where the regulations and the law supports the decisions to a very large extent. Mm. And, and take the decisions in a manner that is fair. Mm. And I, I don't mind hearing from you and having your own viewpoint. The, the company that ordered the explosives 
I don't know to what extent that company can be held liable for the manufacture and transportation of the explosives. So you have ordered for food, if you want, if you allow me to use this example. You've placed an order for a food to be delivered, for food to be delivered to you. The person who prepares the food and the person who transports the food, to what extent can you, the person who ordered for the food, be held liable for food, food poisoning, for example, or that the food was not prepared properly or that it was not transported properly? So we still have not been able to have a proper legitimate ground to hold Chirano Company Limited, li not so much liable, but to say that uh, their conduct or their involvement is such that they ought to suspend their operations whilst the investigations mm. are being, are being, are being uh, carried out. I, I, don't, I don't see it. So I, because I they are not directly it. involved, well, the portions of the ally that you read that I've seen talks about regulations regarding carrying explosives, conveyance by road, and a lot of this, to be fair, will deal with the organization doing the conveying. That is, that is so exactly. we, we do not have all those. But just back to the different investigations and the issue of without prejudice, is it not going to be problematic for multiple investigations to be happening? Because you, you did point out correctly that the police may want to look at road safety issues. Fire service may want to look at do an audit of whatever happened in terms of dealing with the fire or the, the, the because there was a mm -hmm. fire before. Now, to the extent that this was explosives and they fall within the domain of the mining area, would it not be better for all the other investigations to subsume under what you are doing or to have a committee that involves all the components? Mm. Because there are certain facts that if one side puts out could compromise your work. I'll give you an example. Mm. The police issued a statement saying that the accident was caused by a motorbike mm -hmm. that crossed mm -hmm. the track. Interviews conducted subsequently with the supposed driver of the motorbike rider points contrary. He says he was hit by a different vehicle and had been conveyed to a hospital before he heard that there was even an explosion. But the police has put this out already. So thinking about all that's happening, is there not a more comprehensive way of dealing with this than the what I would call even a piecemeal approach with different parties doing their different components? Well, this is why, first of all, the various investigations which are being conducted continue to be preliminary investigations, initial investigations, mm. for us to be able to assemble the basic facts. I believe on the basis of the basic facts, we can then be able to form a well-reasoned opinion or come to a well-reasoned conclusion mm -hmm. as to whether or not, first of all, there ought to be further investigations. And if there ought to be further investigations, what should be the nature of those investigations? And should we, uh, for, for instance, have a more um, one-stop investigations of a sort? That's number one. Number two, I'm working closely with the Minister for Interior mm. and the other uh, agencies of the government. So it's not as though the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources and the Minerals Commission are working so independent of the other investigative efforts which are being made. We are collaborating and we are coordinating the efforts which are being waged. Thirdly, I think we also have to be a little careful as to the accounts we rely on. You know. So the police are I've said one thing, this uh, individual is also saying another thing. I don't know whether we should believe a state institution which is mandated to conduct investigations as opposed to a driver who was involved in an accident and who may not even have had a proper recollection of what happened. And so, so, but those are also matters that we have to be careful about. But fundamentally and finally, what is important is that we have these preliminary investigations and when these investigations are concluded, we will be able to come to a definitive and well-reasoned conclusion as to what mm. courses of actions okay. are required. But I also need to point them. out that some of the information put out by the police could even prejudice the outcome. For example, uh, Kwesi Fori, I think it's DSP, if, I, if that's yeah, the DSP. title, has said in the press release he signed that there was a police escort. And in fact, the police escort is doing well. He's alive. Again, this could go to the heart of what you're investigating because when we come to, again, conveyance by road, 
<laughs> in your law. There are very clear things that have to be done. Yes. So if the prior to a preliminary investigation, and this was the police said this to us on Friday, that there was a police escort, okay, is that not prejudicial to the outcome? Because if your committee, your 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 uh, your, in, your institution is investigating. In fact, I interviewed one of the DC, the NADMO coordinator for Christian Huni Valley, and his account is completely different, right? He gave an account of somebody who was on a hill who saw all that happened. And some of the things he says completely contradicts what the police is saying. Obviously, this should be of concern to you that the police is saying there was a police escort. The man I interviewed said there was no police escort. They, they certainly should not be a problem at all, in my view. I mean, the efforts we are making at the ministry is very much in uh, uh, close collaboration with the Ghana Police Service. As I said to you this morning, I got a, a briefing of the outcome of the initial investigation by the Minerals Commission. The report is being delivered to me. I raised some questions and um, uh, I've put in place another layer of investigative mechanism to answer those questions for me. And what I've actually done is that I've put together a small team independent of the Minerals Commission to review the report of the Minerals Commission so that I can have uh, if you want, for want of a better expression, an independent, uh, well-nuanced uh, mm. interrogation of the report of the Minerals Commission. So all of that has been done. I appreciate your concern and anxiety. Mm. It's something that I've also averted my mind to. Mm. But I'm clear in my mind that it will and can be resolved. And as a result of these series of investigations and efforts we are making, mm. there will be much more clarity as to what happened. Now, so for instance, the question of escorts. I also posed this question this morning, which is that when it is said that there was escort, what is the nature of the escort? We need to know. I mean, that's one fundamental question or issue that we need to resolve. What's the nature of the escort? Was a policeman in the explosive vehicle or was there a vehicle leading the explosive vehicle? These are all nitty gritties we have to iron out. And what does the law require? And, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm even already beginning to form the opinion that perhaps we have to take a second look at the law because uh, what is the nature of the vehicle which should be used to transport explosives mm. and so on and so forth. So there are fine details which have to be resolved. But what is important and what is fundamental, and I need to point that out, is that we establish the facts honestly and establish the facts in a manner that uh, uh, those facts are reasonably unimpeachable, incontrovertible. My question, how sure are you that that's going to happen? This is the reason I'm pushing is that it appears some of the investigation outcomes have been prejudiced by comments already made, which is why I'm asking, with all that has been said already, how sure are we that the Minerals Commission can come out and say, for example, there was no police escort? No, we when, when the police has come out to say there was an escort? No, we should be able to, well, but the police are not sacrosanct, you know. And, and I'm not suggesting that what they put out is wrong. Uh, what they put out may turn out uh, to be the case. And I have every reason to rely on the outcome of police investigations. And I have no reason to doubt what they put out. But I'm saying that uh, the fine details, and, and, and that's the point I'm, where I'm drawing your attention to, the point that the police made about escorts, they, they, may, they, they, they may not be wrong which is that there was an escort. But what is the nature of the escort? We need to interrogate that. That is drilling down. Okay. And, and it's important that we drill down. And what is equally important, perhaps even more important, is that these facts are established with integrity. Because mm. it's important. I mean, my, 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 my good, 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 good friend, Bernard, it's important that when these things happen as a country, we, we get the facts. Okay. Was there a police escort or not? Yes, there was. What was the nature of the police uh, escort? This was the nature of the police escort. Mm. Uh, were the explosives put in a proper vehicle? They were put in a proper They were not. There shouldn't be one set of facts, another set of facts. Mm. So we need to establish the facts. That's the first of all. In respect of the, this particular incident, and then when these things happen, okay. it also calls on policymakers like myself to examine the institutional regime and framework we have okay. as it stands Quickly now. on this final yeah. point. So Maxam has been suspended whilst investigations go on. Do we know how long investigations will take? Number two, we interviewed Dr. Tony Aubin, formerly of the Minerals Commission, on our Saturday show, The Big Issue. And he was asked, he wasn't really doubting, he was wondering whether suspending Maxam may not become counterproductive in the interim because quite a number of mining companies depend on this. Is the main 
at least one of the major explosives manufacturers in the country. So by suspending them, even temporarily, it will suggest that orders that have been placed and mining companies that may need some of the explosives that they transport or they produce may not be able to get what they need up until a certain point. Thinking about that, what was your contemplation in suspending them? So this morning I met the Ghana Chamber of Mines and they brought this matter to my attention. I've asked them to put it in writing and they have actually give me statistics about uh, the impact it will have on their work and the impact it will have on the national economy, on revenue, and so on. We are very mindful of that. I'm not oblivious of that at all. The reason why this decision was taken primarily was so that, you know, we are not grouping in the dark. We are not taking a leap in the dark so that we understand the issues at the base level. Minister, an incident like this has happened. The company that was responsible for the manufacture of these explosives, you allow them to continue to work. What if a day or two after you, you receive reports that a similar incident is happening somewhere? How are you going to answer that? So the responsible thing to do in circumstances like this is that you put a halt to the operations of that company. So you don't get a recurrence of that situation until such time that you are reasonably satisfied that even if you were to leave the ban or you were to leave the suspension, you will not have an immediate or a further recurrence of this incident. So that's the reason for it. In any event, the company is not given the nature of the investigations. Uh, the company does not have the uh, uh, potential, okay? The company does not have the potential to interfere with the investigations because this is an investigation being conducted by state institutions into a, the activities or the operations of a private company. So one can reasonably conclude that this company cannot interfere with the investigations. But the real rationale, the reason for taking that decision is because we don't have a recurrence of that incident. Under what circumstances is this company operating? Why did this incident happen? You still have not been able to assemble these basic facts and you allow the company to operate. What if tomorrow you wake up and that they say the mm. company was transporting explosives to another mining company and those explosives have exploded? That would be more scandalous. That would be more scandalous. All so right. that's the reason for this decision. But we are mindful. Mm. I'm fully, fully, fully mindful of the potential impact mm. that this suspension can have on the larger industrial work mm. of the mining right. companies of our country. We'll, we'll, we'll this is the point of view. We're talking to Minister for Lands and Natural Resources and also Member of Parliament for Damon Gonabo. Samuel Abu Jinapo on the big issue Thursday, 20th January, an explosion at Bogosu Apieti, about 10 minutes' drive from Bogosu. We understand about 13 people have lost their lives. We haven't confirmed the full number yet. Lots of buildings destroyed. The government is trying to do some things. We'll come back and deal with some of what government has done beyond the investigation. But there are also other issues. Under his ministry, the fight against Galam says some think it's a lost cause. Some think it's possible. We'll would also look at the tree planting exercise. Over 1 million trees were to have been planted. What is the state of those trees? All of these and more when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome once again to Malaria 360. Prevention is an important tool in this fight against malaria. One way of preventing malaria is by sleeping under an insecticide treated net every night throughout the night. Get yourself an insecticide treated net immediately. Remember to air dry it in a shaded area for 48 hours before sleeping under it. When dirty, wash it with mouth soap and water. When torn, you can use a needle and thread to sew it up. If you have to step out, adhere to all the COVID-19 safety protocols in place. COVID-19 is real, and so is malaria. Zero malaria starts with me and you. Malaria 360, it's everything malaria.
for the occasion. With ATL, you can never be out of style. ATL, bringing fabric to life. Can you invest in Fortune 500 stars and more? Can you help the planet and boost your wealth? With Standard Chartered Priority Banking, you don't need to stop and think. Investing with us goes further. We connect with global fund managers, select funds that suit your needs, bringing global expertise right here. We connect you to wealth opportunities that match your priorities. Join today. I woke up this morning. Nothing wakes me up better than a cup of cowbell coffee. Delicious coffee aroma. Mmm. How can you forget your lines again? I'm sorry, sir. Just that it tastes really good. Cowbell coffee. Enjoy the delicious creamy coffee taste of three in one cowbell taste coffee. It it's a beautiful day. Oh. Waiting. <laughs> cowbell coffee. <laughs> This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight we are hosting Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, whose ministry is at the heart of a big story, tragic explosion, Bogoswa Pieti. We've been showing you, in fact, we'll be showing you some of the scenes from the place. Government is trying to repair the road, started over the weekend. Almost all the houses in that community had their roofs blown off. Luckily, there was nobody in the school at the time that this incident occurred. Our reporter has been up and down the place. Government is housing these displaced people at the Catholic Relief Center. The vice president led a delegation which comprised the Minister for Lands, Information Minister, Interior Minister, and Chiefs of our Security to visit the place on Friday. And we understand government is trying to give them temporary relief as a permanent rebuilding is done. I need to make a quick correction. So I refer to the Director of Public Affairs of the Ghana Police Service as a DSP, I really apologize. So, Mr. Kwesifori is an assistant commissioner of police. So, Mr. Kwesifori, forgive me, you're an ACP, you've been on this show before, forgive me. So, I wanted to move to something else and show you a quick video. Now, the, the Galamse fight is of great concern. Our Ashanti Regional Court respondent visited some communities to ascertain what the fight was on and how it was going. I'm going to show that quick report and I'll ask you a question about it. So, this is. Uh, uh, Edward Marfus report from one of the Galamse riddled communities in Ashanti. In mining areas in southern Ghana in particular, it appears almost every area has vast land where mining activities have taken place but no reclamation has been done. These abandoned pits end up becoming death traps or dugouts, which cannot be used even for farming activities. The Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources says these are usually as a result of illegal mining and small-scale mining activities. The ministry has thus begun an initiative to restore various lands. One of the areas where efforts have been put in place to reclaim the land is a Siwa in the Bosome Fremo district of the Ashanti region. The consultant for the Minerals Commission for the Ghana Reclamation Program, Jojo Tibudakun, has been speaking to the media on measures being put in place to reclaim the land in the area. From illegal mining. Um, there's a small pit down there. That was a sample we left out. It's at the extreme end there. We can look at it later. That's what we had around all over the place. Uh, we spent about, uh, since August 31st up to now, we spent roughly, I'll say, four months here. Uh, with the water, we decanted. Uh, we did an environmental assessment in this area. Um, we did a geoscience. We had a drone shoot to assess how we're going to actually get the volumes to actually reclaim the place. And then we did a, a massive um, community sensitization in the area, uh, a top level, 
and a lower level. The top level is engaging all the chiefs and all the uh, opinion leaders around here. Then we went to house to house to educate them on what we're coming to do here. Uh, this, what you see here, is the effect of uh, uh, work within four months. Um, we, from now on, uh, from uh, February going, the next thing we're going to do is going to have a bit of topsoil and then we're going to start doing planting in this place when the rains come in March. Uh, we have uh, another level of uh, community work to do uh, to discuss with the community um, the types of uh, plants we're going to have here. There's an indigenous plant which is already here, you can see behind us. This is part of the Busum Tree Forest Enclave, Forest Reserve Enclave. So with the help of forestry, we will do some palm uh, and then whatever the community. But here, we do that more of a bit of what the uh, ecosystem actually allows us to do here. So that was Edward Opomafo's report. You were there, I believe, where this was shown. It, it looks very serious, the nature of the <laughs> devastation. You've been in office for a year. Are we winning the Galamse fight? Um, we are on the right track when we are putting the correct measures in place. The, if you allow me, the issue of illegal small scale mining, it's important for you to understand the history of it, for you to be able to appreciate the situation we find ourselves in and the measures government is putting, government is putting in place to deal with it. The uh, matters relating to small scale mining are, are far reaching. In, in many, many, many years ago, pre-independence, post-independence, all the way through to the 1980s, specifically 1989, mm -hmm. when the PNDC uh, made the attempt to regularize small-scale mining and legislate in order to be able to regulate small-scale mining in our country. And over the period, all the way to the year 2000s, all through to now, when the governance uh, architecture literally broke down and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, one of the main problems which uh, we are dealing with and which I will say is one of the uh, major fundamental causative factors for the situation we find ourselves in was that the conceptual uh, underpinnings and how small scale mining was structured had been done away with and uh, a different regime was put in place mm. by the actors involved. So small scale mining was essentially supposed to be uh, small scale mining if you mm. want where you used basic tools, basic implements to mine, and it was supposed to be community-based, and it was supposed to be participated in by only Ghanaians. But over the years, we had a situation where you had foreigners uh, getting involved in small-scale mining, and foreigners in collaboration and conspiring with Ghanaians, using indiscriminately to engage in small-scale mining, use particularly of excavators, mercury, mm -hmm. cyanide, and the rest, and which is brought about the situation we find ourselves in today. Mm. Now, uh, in the first term of President Akufuado, a lot of efforts was made and um, an at a bold attempt was made to sanitize mosque in fact, At a point in time, there was even a moratorium, there was a ban, or mm. there was a suspension of small scale mining in our country. And fast forward, in the second term, we've had to deal with the same situation. It's important, and it's not as though I am throwing my hands in despair at all, but it's always important for us to um, come to terms with the realities of the situation in order for us to be able to formulate policies and solutions to deal with them. The extractive industry, especially where we're talking about money, mm -hmm. Bernard, gold is money. <laughs> that's, that's a hard truth. And the amounts of money involved in this industry are huge. We're talking about significant amounts of money in this industry. When you are dealing with a, a problem like that, people don't let go easily. People are recalcitrant because they are, you, are, you are dealing with a situation in a manner that would deprive them of their incomes and significant incomes. So we have put in place considerable measures to deal with this situation. And if you ask me, have we lost the fight? I would say we have not lost the fight. Mm. On the con no, not at all. On the contrary, we have put in place uh, a program and um, a regime in place which is responding to the situation forcefully. And if you want evidence of that, let me give you that evidence. Today, the sense of impunity in the small-scale mining sector is no more the case. In the past, people were brazenly involved and engaged in small-scale mining 
without any fear of consequences. That is not the situation today. And I, that I can say without a shred of doubt that people out there who take a decision to be involved in small scale mining honestly believe that the state enforcement architecture is now robust enough to respond to it. There's a feeling that there are people who are political people, some in the MPP, who do Galam say, reference is made to the Eastern region. I remember there was some controversy around the Denchembo area, and a prominent MPP member in the region was mentioned as being involved. There was back and forth. Now, the reason people are concerned is that it was reported that you said that it would take us four to ten years to solve Galamse. To think that this campaign started in 2017, we are in 2022, that's already six years, or two, five, five years, and you're now saying it takes us, if you did, this, if you did say, it takes us four <laughs> to ten years, then that suggests that this is not something you're going to, no, to no, win no, anytime no, no. soon. I never said that. I never said that. It was an interview like I'm having with you. And what I said was that this is not um, a fight we can resolve overnight. Mm. And I said it will take us a good number of years. I mm. said four, but, and not a definitive date. I don't give definitive dates. But it was the real point I was seeking to make is that this is not something we can resolve overnight. And it's a fact. We cannot resolve this overnight. I'm not going to pretend or give any assurance that this particular matter will be resolved overnight. What is important is that we take the measures which are necessary, okay? We take the measures which are necessary, which are contemporarily necessary, and we do so with a sense of integrity. And that is exactly what we've been doing. I'll give you some of them. One, we have said that prospecting, recognizance, and exploration in forest reserves is totally outlawed now. That's a very significant intervention we've made. Because in the past, people came for licenses to prospect or to uh, engage in exploration or to engage in recognizance, and they turned around to mine. So to putting in place that measure is helped considerably. We have said that water bodies and forest reserves have now been designated as red zones and that there should be totally no mining whatsoever in these areas. And we have equally gone a step further to decommission and or demobilize um, excavators which are found in these red zones. That has helped considerably. Another point that I need to make, the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources has the sole discretion and the sole prerogative to grant my, uh, mining licenses and leases. Mm. How that discretion or prerogative is exercised has a fundamental impact on how small scale mining is conducted in our country. If the minister dis uh, goes about signing them indiscriminately and doing so without regard to the environment, that can impact. And you can check, you're an investigative mm. journalist, you can check mm. the number of licenses and leases that I have signed as minister. I exercise that discretion responsibly. There's a fear now, that during prior to elections, the resolve reduces. So, for example, 2017, 2018, there was a lot of noise. By 2019, 2020, things came down. We are post-election, so it's the same cycle. There isn't an election because the feeling, the feeling is that because Galamse funds local elections, when we get close to elections, somehow the political calculation is that the fight against Galamse will hurt the government. So, but we should have so warned pressure in the mining is brought constituency on you. So then actually, yes, one of the reasons... We should have warned in the mining constituency. We didn't win in the yeah, mining Yeah, be, because, of the, that's that's the that's because of the fight. So because of the fight that you initiated 2017, 2018 as a government, you were punished in the mining communities for the Galamse fight. So now you are making a lot of noise about Galamse. But by close of next year, you will reduce the noise because there are primaries going to be held. There's going to be a lot of concerns from Galamse fed communities about the effects of the fight against their livelihoods. Then you begin to slow well, down your then, fight. Then the, the reduction of the noise prior to the election should have been nailed politically to the advantage of the MPP. The MPP lost in almost all the mining constituencies of our country, except Takwa. We lost almost where well, constituencies we won even in 1960s, no, since 90 President Cromer's time, MPP is won in those constituencies. In 2020, we lost in those constituencies. You won Obuasi, uh, it's a mining community. There well, are lots of well, mining communities that you won. Go and check the, the votes. Are you the talking about Western region or Western? Western, no, the Western Central regions. Almost all the mining constituencies in those regions, we lost them. Upper uh, Dinchira West or is it Dinchira South? This is a constituency which is a uh, stronghold of the MPP, which will help. Since and you think it's a Galamse-induced loss? Well, it's not so much a Galamse-induced loss. It is the, the matter to do with the resolve the president uh, had in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of even putting his presidency on the line and, and, and being... But did he put his presidency he, on he the did. line? That is why he lost those constituencies because he really? really, he persevered. He persevered in the fight against Garamsey. But that is not even the point. The point that I need to make about the issue of the cycle 
is that why you lose votes in a mining constituency is, uh, can be accounted for through reasons which are varied. You know, one is the, what I've observed though in those constituencies. There are those who are for the galamsey. There are those who are for mining, indiscriminate mining, regardless of the consequences on the mm -hmm. environment. And there are those who are against mining. And so if you don't strike the balance well, you almost lose both so if sides. So you say you put this presence on, like, what's the most important success in the Galamsey fight since 2017? What's the most important thing that President Akufuado has done to show that he's committed to winning the Galamsey fight? The whole, the whole institutional architecture, what he put in place, the institutional framework. But what has if, it even that, Has it led if, to a reduction even, in, even, in, in, even in the, illegal mining? Even the attention which was uh, put, the attention, the focus, on this particular issue, which made it almost a national issue. In the, don't forget, and check it out. I'm not going to make comparisons. Go and check when the institutional and enforcement regime broke down. You will see where this illegal mining and galamsey took root in our country. No, my question is, when, when you travel around the so, country, you still see water bodies polluted. I mean, a friend of mine went to the Western region three weeks ago. He says that there are even towns you go to. Every signboard in the town is Chinese. The, the, the galamse is still going on. Listen to me. You l Listen, I don't want to get into some uh, subtle comparisons. The ban on small-scale mining was instituted in 2017, just after President Akufuado came into office. The, the statement President Akufuado made that he would put his presidency on the line uh, to fight illegal small-scale mining was made in 2017. And I want to repeat, the ban on small-scale mining was instituted in 2017. It tells you that he inherited a problem. The water bodies were heavily polluted in 2017, so much so that when the president paid a state visit in, Ab in, in Abidjan, when he went to Cote d'Ivoire, the authorities in Cote d'Ivoire pointed out to him that the water bodies in Ghana had been polluted so much that they were polluting the water bodies of Cote d'Ivoire in 2017, early 2017. And so it, it cannot be a problem which was um, so pretended by President Akufo. He inherited no, I, I'm saying, but he inherited it. He inherited it. Don't, don't, mm. Hold on. He inherited it. And, and he, he took steps to deal with it. Now, the point I'm making to you is that the water bodies, the water bodies, if you travel around the country and you see River Pra, which is polluted, and the color of River Pra is one that is distasteful, with the greatest of respect, I need to point this out because that is the truth. The expert advice I've gotten is the level of pollution of these river bodies over many, many, many years and the chemicals which have been used to pollute, uh, which have been used to engage in this pollution, it will take us a considerable period of time of undisturbed river bodies in our country for us to restore the natural state of the river bodies of our country. And this is advice that was given to me by the University of Mines. The, the, the experts uh, expert at the University of Mines have pointed out to me that they talk about the color of river bodies. Mr. Minister, be careful to uh, 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 tie up the sources of the government's policies to the color of the river bodies. Because in their view, given the period of pollution and the materials which were used to pollute the river bodies of our country, it will take some considerable period of time mm. for the river bodies to clear. And, exactly. and they've even been suggestions to me that we probably should uh, be deliberate in introducing some uh, organic interventions, some uh, chemical interventions to, uh, 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 if you want, fast track the restoration of the river bodies of our country. Mm. So, Bernard, that cannot be a litmus test. I'm sure we'll spend more time on this. Let me talk about the tree planting. I recall we did a couple of interviews with you last year when you, you were pushing, in fact, 2020, pushing the tree planting agenda. Um, how many trees were actually planted? So we had a target of 5 million trees for Green Ghana Day alone. But it's important even before we delve into that for me to put it in the context that we have to look at it. We have to look at it in a context which is uh, appropriate. And the context is that the government has an afforestation program mm. which we are implementing. The statistics which have been given to me suggest that from 1900 to date, 80% of our country's forest cover has been depleted. We've lost 80% of the forest cover of our country. And so the president has put together a program to restore the forest cover of Ghana. And there are various 
uh, measures which we are prosecuting to restore the forest cover of Ghana. One of them is Green Ghana Day. Mm. And the Green Ghana Day, we had a target of 5 million trees. Mm -hmm. In the end, we planted 7 million trees. Okay. Of course, generally as a result of the enthusiasm shown by the population. And we also have ongoing, ongoing okay. afforestation and reforestation mm. programs and schemes, which we are uh, implementing all year round mm. to restore. So of the 7 million cover. trees planted, how many were officially planted by the program and how many were planted by ordinary enthusiastic citizens do we know the forestry commission raised i think uh, between five to six million seedlings mm -hmm. uh, five to six million seedlings definitely i know okay. that for so let's time. assume it's six million i'm asking these numbers because it was recently reported that over 12 million cities was used to buy seedlings for the project so if that is correct they're coming to do accounting here. Eh? A bit of it. <laughs> if you spent 12 million on 6 million seedlings, that means each seedling is two cities. I mean, is, it, is that not on the high side? Just general arithmetic. Whoa. 12 million cities spent on procuring about 6 million trees. 6 well, million seedlings. That, that seems quite serious. Well first, of all, to, well, first of all, I don't procure the seedlings. The Forestry Commission does. Mm. Second of all, um, uh, the processes that were used to procure the seedlings uh, have, in my, in my examination, been consistent with the procurement laws and uh, regulations of our country. And third of all, uh, when this matter came up in Parliament and I answered the question in Parliament, the industry players, including the Forestry Commission, gave me a firm indication that this was actually one of the subsidized, one of actually the subsidized rates which mm. were applied to uh, procure the seedlings in question. And, and so, I mean, if there is any reason why we should question this expenditure, let's... Uh, I'm asking because looking at the look enthusiasm at that the media showed, I remember one of my colleagues, Kojo's mother, planted over 50 trees. There's a lot of people who volunteer to plant trees. The, the Forestry Commission need to procure 6 million trees for this project, in addition to all that Ghanaians were willing to do to support this laudable exercise? Well, but having said they procure six million, I can give you the exact seedlings. figure. Seedlings? Uh, no, having said they procure six million seedlings, I can give you the exact figure. The Forestry Commission and the Ministry had a target, mm. a target of seedlings that we wanted to plant. And therefore, at the very least, they ought to have raised that number of seedlings. Okay, so we said we'll plant five million seedlings. And if you say you plant five million seedlings, you better be sure that on the eve of the day, you must have five million seedlings raised, mm. which, is the, which is what the Forestry Commission did. What the churches, what the, the mother of your friend is supposed to have done and planted and the rest, those become an addition. So this year, we have said that we'll plant 20, millions, 20 million trees on Green Ghana Day. It means that for purpose of planting, for purpose of planning, mm -hmm. the Forestry Commission better be in a position to raise 20 million trees on that day. Unless <coughs> we change plans and say that we will plant, we intend to plant 20 million trees. However, we will raise 10 million trees and hope to elicit enough interest in the exercise to get ordinary Ghanaians and corporate Ghana to raise 10 million trees. But that was not the plan last year. The strategy last year was that I wanted to plant 5 million seedlings, 5 million trees, and therefore, if you want to plant 5 million trees, you better make is sure... Is there a way in which you can know how the 7 million trees are doing? Yes, yes. We have a monitoring and evaluation team in place. And the Forestry Commission itself at their outfit have a monitoring and evaluation outfit there. And the ministry is set up a monitoring and evaluation unit here, which is monitoring how these trees are doing. The last report I got suggested that about 80% of the trees are doing well. And you can check it out. I see. So the next tree planting day, we are hoping to plant another 20 million in addition to the 6 or 7 million. Yes, yes, yes. We're hoping to plant 20 million trees. And Bernard, why not? So, 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 so mm. should it be. And, and this time mm. around, they already the initial planning, I've set up the planning committee already. Uh, very soon we will announce the date for this year's Green Ghana Day. And um, the, we have to be even more ambitious as we move forward. As I've said to you, 80% of our forest cover is depleted, and this time around we want to do it a bit more differently. We want to have designated mm. landscapes. We want to have designated areas where people will plant. Okay. okay, so 
the Ministry and the Forestry Commission will make an effort to designate <coughs> areas in our country where institutions, individuals, Forestry Commission itself, and all of us will go to to plant. So if you go to, say, um, Eastern Region, you, we've uh, designated various areas in the Eastern Region where people will go and plant so that the monitoring of how the trees do will be easier. And also, in future, we can point out that these are the places where the Green Ghana effort planted trees. And further also that we can preserve those trees and say that these trees ought not to be harvested. Mm. So if within the next three, three, four years, we're able to plant 100 million trees as a country, we can make it a policy that the trees which are planted under Green Ghana Day ought to survive for a certain period of time and they should never be harvested. Right. The problem we've had here, my friend, is that people have dealt with uh, the forest cover of our country in a manner that, uh, I should say, uh, is not been in accord with the national interest. Because mm. you keep harvesting trees and you don't plant. It makes it unsustainable. In other, in other places I've, I've been to, we have, there are vast tracts of plantations where it's a policy that nobody harvests trees from all of these areas. And right. I think that we need to... This is still the point of view. We're still talking to Honorable Samo Jinapo. When we come back, we'll find out what's going to happen in Parliament. Later on Tuesday, Parliament reconvenes. The E-level will be big on the agenda. We've seen him on his feet in many of the debates, uh, debating the legality or otherwise of some of the issues. So what's going to happen? Plus the newly proposed land law, is it going to get the full support of all or are there issues to be resolved? Stay with us. Welcome back. The point of view is focusing on the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, a man whose ministry is at the center of the, um, the biggest story in the week. The explosion at Bugoswa Pieta has been talking to us about how he intends to get to the bottom of the matter. We've also been talking about the fight against Galamse and also the issue of the tree planting. Parliament reconvenes on Tuesday. In the build-up to your rising, we noticed that there was a lot of debate. Number one, all, M all ministers who are MPs go to Parliament every day now. You don't have the luxury of working from elsewhere. And number two, the e-levy, what's the position? Is it going to go through? Well, first of all, um, I will reconvene tomorrow, the 25th, Tuesday the 25th, um, with the greatest of respect. I want to uh, humbly suggest that we go there and um, engage in decorous debates, constructive debates, enlightened debates. That is what parliaments everywhere are supposed to do. Mm. The word parliament uh, emanates from the French word parlo, speak. So um, uh, there is a chamber for debate. And so some of the incidents which took place in the um, last meeting of the previous session of parliament ought not to be uh, part of this parliament. I think that we all have to make a conscious effort not to be engaged in those kinds of um, uh, incidents. Uh, it doesn't do any credit to the parliament of our country, to the democracy of our country, and to our country as a, as, 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 as a whole. Uh, e levy will it pass? I think in all of this discussion, too, uh, we need to always pay attention to the national interest. What is the national interest? What is the public interest? What is the interest of the Ghanaian people? What will save the Ghanaian people? I think it's very important. Bernard, in many occasions, we've had to, we've gone on these matters on partisan basis far too long. Mm. Uh, MPP position, NDC position. So where we find ourselves after COVID, the difficulties we've had to go through, the issues of the impact of this pandemic on our national economy. And you have a lot of experience and you have some expertise in national economies and the rest and the, uh, uh, the events which are happening elsewhere in the world. In the United Kingdom, for instance, inflationary figures for December is the highest in the past 30 years. The cost of living in England where has been predicted to be the highest in the past 30 years come April. Those are facts. The contraction of the UK economy is the highest since the great frost of 1917, we are told. In the United States, President uh, Biden is trying to put in place a recovery plan because the cost of bread, the cost of fuel, the cost of house skyrocketing. 
Ghana, with the greatest of repairs, is not an island. The global eco economy is going through a lot of difficulties. Here in Ghana, our government never cuts uh, pay. The, the government paid all our wages in full. In other jurisdictions, in the course of the pandemic, wages were cut down. Workers were laid off. Not a single worker was laid off in the public sector of our country because of COVID. Free electricity, free water, all the interventions. Do you expect the 1.75 to stand or will the government come up with a different proposal? Whether the 1.75 should stand or whether the e-levy should be passed is the point I'm making that should be examined and interrogated within this context. Within the context of our, the recovery of our national economy. The Ghanaian economy, not the NPP economy. The economy which will, the NDC says they want to win the next elections in the unlikely event, touch wood. If they so won, the, that the if they won part, that election, so you're saying they, that the they, they, they should be is, interested is a sink in, or to the economic recovery. The way it is, There's it, no it alternative. Is, it, is, it is having, somebody tell me the alternative. IMF. I'm very happy to hear the alternative. Some people say IMF. Uh, Some economists say go to the IMF. They why, will support but, you. But we've gone the route of IMF before. We've seen the consequences of that. And my good friend, who can, who proudly as a Ghanaian patriotically say that we should go to a, a, a foreign institution, a multinational institution with our hands tied up to go and ask for help when we can build our economy ourselves within. So whether e-levy will pass, will not pass, whether it should be reduced, should not be reduced, whatever you say about e-levy, I think the Ghanaian people should examine and look at it from the context of our national economy. If anybody were to convince me that Mr. Minister, this route you are taking is not one that will help your economy. A lot of it's small businesses who depend on mobile transactions think that the e-levy will damage their prospects. That the e-levy has not been implemented. But so, based so on the I, understanding I, I of how it's been uh, proposed. The, I mean, the e-levy has not been implemented. And, and so, and so, but, but the point about revenue, revenue as a function of expenditure, the balance between revenue and expenditure, mm. and the need for enhanced expenditure in times of recession, in times of depression, in times of economic downturn, it's all been established. I mean, I'm not an economist, but I've read, for instance, that some of the economists uh, in history had proposed that even when you have a recession, even if you employed people to just go and dig pits and cover the pits and pay them, it's a better means of recovering your economy because right. when you have a downturn... So create more what, jobs then. Yeah, when, but that's the whole point. The you start and what we seek to do with the you start yeah. requires revenue. It's a lot of expenditure. So Bernard, if I may conclude on that, the fundamental point I'm making, I'm not too sure that the e-levy is going to preoccupy the parliament, this meeting of parliament immediately or in whatever time because government is putting in place other measures to cushion the economy whilst we go through this. But the most important thing, and it's not me who should ask, not just me who should ask that question. You should ask that question, Bernard. Ghanaian should ask that question. What is in our national interest? What will get us to go, to be on a path of record recovery right. of our national economy? That's Thank what you. is important. Thank you for talking to us. When should we expect the report from your, the committee, or the, the, your, your minerals committee? The, the, the body that's investigating the explosion. The work is being done in earnest, and now I'm on it. I mean, I've not um, uh, uh, had a sleep, a, 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 a single sleep over this. I mean, I've been following up on it on a daily basis. And as I said to you this morning, I chaired a meeting where we looked at the initial report that has been brought. These are very sensitive, delicate matters. So you can't share the initial report with us. Not yet. I mean, but when it's all done, we'll share it with the Ghanaian people. But the most important thing is that we get on with it and do it quickly all so right. that we can resolve these issues once and for all. Thank you, Honorable Samuel Abujinapo. He is the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources and MP for Damongo. We couldn't speak about his constituency. Hopefully, next time we'll do that. I'll take you there. Actually, we'll be going there on the Heritage Caravan. Oh, oh, oh. So we'll pass through the Larabanga. When Mosque. you get there, you find that the, the roads in Damango have been asphalted. So but the, the, the Fufusu Sola Road has started deteriorating. <laughs> we are going to fix that as well. But the Damango town roads have been asphalted. And mm -hmm. I think you have a good so right there. So is Larabanga in your constituency? That is so. Larabanga is in my constituency. Then we'll be coming there. It's March 5 to 12. It's one of my favorite places in Damango constituency. They I have had, some of my biggest votes there. I see. <laughs> I, I actually saw your poster in a bar, in a tailor shop in Lambanga <laughs> when we went there the first time. So as we said, the Heritage Caravan is on from 5th to 12th March. We'll put the advert on the screen. Register if you want to see his constituency, Lambanga Mosque, and there's a beautiful rock there. It's an amazing seven-day journey across and the, the country. And the Moli National Park. It's visit. also in his constituency and the neighboring as well. So <laughs> hope to see you on that. My name is Bernard Avle. Thank you very much for watching. The Business Dashboard is right next.